This video will walk you through the fundamental theorem of algebra, which talks about how many solutions a polynomial function should have, as well as review how to find zeros of all types using some of the lessons you've learned about synthetic division, using your graphing calculator, factoring, etc. So let's talk about what the fundamental, fundamental theorem of algebra is. Basically, in a nutshell, you can see in your notes here some more mathematical language related to this, but basically, the degree of your function tells you the amount of solutions that you can expect to have in your function. So you've got two examples here of functions underneath the number one, just simply asking how many solutions does the equation have? Really simple here. Look at function A, okay? Establish what the degree is. The degree is three. If the degree is three, here's what that means. There are three solutions. Simple as that. Now, these solutions may be nice integers, maybe they're fractions, maybe they're square root numbers, maybe they're complex numbers, they're imaginary numbers. Just because there are three solutions does not mean that they're going to be easily visible on the graph. So that's just something to keep in mind with these type of problems. It doesn't always mean that you're going to have nice, clean answers, but it means there are going to be three of them. You look at the second function here in B, x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 18x squared minus 27. Same deal. Establish what's the degree. The degree is 4. Guess what that means? There are four solutions. So once again, one of the basic facts about these polynomials is if you know the degree, you know how many solutions you should have. It's just a matter of figuring out what types of solutions they are and how do you mathematically verify them. So we're going to take a look here at one very big example, a very large function here that we're going to walk through a lot of the same steps that you saw in the last section dealing with finding rational zeros. We're going to use our graphing calculator to kind of narrow down what zeros could possibly exist, use some of them to narrow down our function, and then see what kind of end result that we have to kind of verify everything so we get all the solutions that we're supposed to get. So let's take a look here at this next example. So if we take a look here at number two, find all zeros of the function, and you see it's very, very long. First and foremost, we're going to go ahead and punch it in the calculator, which... I've already done. So there's my function and all its grandeur. Everything's punched in. We're going to do uh, punch it in, do what we need to, get a graph. So you can see the graph here. Once again, it kind of goes off the bottom of the uh, screen here. Not a big deal. We're looking for zeros, aka we're looking for x-intercepts. Where does it touch? Where does it pass through the x-axis? Now you'll notice there's a couple of things about this graph. So first and foremost, the degree of this function is five, which means there should be five solutions. If you look at this graph, it's only touching or crossing the x-axis two whole times. So what that's generally an indicator of is possibly a couple of things. One, you can have zeros that are repetitive, that uh, repeat multiple times. The second thing is that you might have zeros that are considered to be imaginary. You can't see imaginary zeros on a regular type of graph like this. You need a special type of graph in order to see real versus imaginary numbers. This type of graph, you're going to kind of see both of these examples here, but just because you don't see it cross five times does not mean there aren't five answers. So let's talk about how we're going to get all those. First things first, I'm going to go to my table just so I can see. I see two numbers that clearly have the y value being zero, therefore we have x-intercepts. We see that negative one and two. We go back to our picture. At two, it crosses through the graph. But at negative one, we see that it just grazes it. It touches it and it bounces. It's at a turning point. Something you may or may not recall from earlier on in the chapter. If your zero occurs at a turning point, that means it occurs multiple times, that specific zero. That's what allows the graph to turn at that point. So if you have an x-intercept where the graph turns on you, that means it's going to occur multiple times. So that's something to keep in mind when we go through and have to do our division and our factoring or whatever the case may be, you might need to use that twice. So let's keep that picture up here. Let's keep that in mind as we go ahead and figure out what the zeros should be. So once again, 
we're going to go ahead and start with the synthetic division process. Now, what you'll see first here is I'm going to go ahead and use negative 1 with a 0. So I'm going to pull that directly from the calculator. Look at your function. No placeholders. That's good. We have a lot of coefficients here, so take your time. Make sure all your signs are right. Make sure all your numbers are written correctly. Now we're going to go ahead and synthetically divide. So pull down the 1. Multiply by what's in the box, add the column, multiply and add, multiply and add, multiply and add, multiply and add. So just like you learned in the last section, the remainder should be zero. And if it is, you're in good shape. So based on this function here, I've got myself an x, an x squared, an x cubed, and an x to the fourth. So, I'm going to go ahead and pull down all those values. We can't do any factoring or solving until we get this to at least an x squared. So, we're going to have to do synthetic division again. As I stated before, at negative 1, that was a bounce point. Therefore, it means that 0 is used multiple times. So, I'm going to go ahead and use negative 1 again. And again, I'm using that twice because it's at a turning point or a bounce point or whatever you want to call it. That's why I'm using this two times. The only time you can use a zero like that twice is when it is at a turning point. So I'm going to go ahead and just pull down all those coefficients from before. Okay, Not even going to bother writing out the function here because it's not useful to us. You can label it if you like. You can rewrite it. But ultimately, you're just going to go ahead and pull down the coefficients because it doesn't start with an x squared. We're going to go ahead and pull down the 1 and start this process again. Multiply add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. Cool, we have another remainder of zero. So far, I'm doing great. So once again, I go ahead, I'm going to label my stuff here. I'm at an x cubed. We're getting closer, but again, that's not something that's going to be factorable or solvable. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is write out and do synthetic division one more time. So there was one other zero that I could pull from my graph, and that was the two. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this down. I'm going to pull down my new coefficients here. I'm going to repeat the process one more time. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. Multiply, add. I'm in great shape. And now I'm down to something that I can actually use. So here's where I'm at. I'm at x squared minus 4x plus 7. Now, this is where it gets a little trickier compared to yesterday. A lot of times when you get it down to x squared, it'll factor. And that's great. It actually saves you more time if it can factor. But as you've learned, not everything factors. You can sit all day and try to figure out, well, what multiplies to 7 and adds to negative 4? Fun fact, nothing that's nice, that is made up of nice integers will. So, if it doesn't factor, we're going to use our good friend quadratic formula to figure out what our remaining zeros should be. Now, keep in mind your graph. We found, we used the three that were visible, the negative 1 twice and the 2. There wasn't any more that you could see. So, that's going to be also a clue that you may not be able to factor stuff if there's no more that you can see. You've got imaginary zeros that are left. Only way you're really going to get to imaginary numbers is if you do quadratic formula. So now I'm going to go ahead and use our quadratic formula. Okay, As a reference, here's our quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That should look familiar. Let's plug in what we know. b is negative 4. The A is 1, the C is 7, all over 2 times A, 2 times 1. I'm going to go ahead and simplify it as much as I can, so I get 4, plus or minus the square root. The number under my root is negative 12, all over 2. Square root of negative 12 breaks down. Keep in mind, it's a negative root, so that means an I is going to be involved when we rewrite this. So I could break that apart into square root of 4 and 3, which becomes 2 
i, square root 3, and again, the i comes into play because it was a negative underneath the root, all over 2. I can divide each of those by 2 and end up with 2 plus or minus i root 3. Now that I've solved and figured out those x's, I've got all my zeros. So my zeros are as such. We've got negative 1, which is called a double root. If you list it twice, it's not something I'm going to really dock you for, but technically in math, when you have the same zero occur multiple times, you call it a double root. You have the 2, and you have 2 plus or minus i root 3. Keep in mind the degree of the problem was a degree of 5, which means you have 5 solutions. You've got negative 1, negative 1 again, the 2, 2 plus i root 3, and 2 minus i root 3. Five zeros, degree of 5, that all lines up, that's your final answer. So again, we're combining a lot of math that you've seen, a lot of math that you know, and we're kind of just putting everything together here in a very big blender. Again, it's a big process. It takes a little while here, but again, it's a lot of synthetic division. It's a lot of using your calculator to verify answers. The trickier part is if it doesn't come out to something that's easily factorable, you have to recognize that you should use quadratic formula to solve that. So this here is your review of the fundamental theorem of algebra. There is another sec uh, part of this uh, notes here that talks about how to write some functions. I'm going to go and do that in a separate video. So look for that here in a separate link to find the next page of the notes.